tree and every stone Every rushing wind and moan They sing your praise By God they sing your praise Every star and over in the sky Tell of your glory divine they shout your praise. They shout your praise. Yeah. You stole them my heart. Yes, you have. You stole them my heart. Yes, you have. You wiped away the stains and broke away the chains. With your love, you set me free. Three nails gave me liberty. So I'll sing your praise. My God, I'll sing your praise. So I sing your praise, yeah. You stole in my heart, yes, you will. You stole in my heart, yes, you will. You wiped away the stains, and you broke away the chains. Stolen my heart, yes you have. 
have broken every chain. Oh God, that you have wiped away every stain. We give you glory and honor in this place tonight, Lord. We ask that you would be with us here. We ask, Lord God, that you would, above all things, be glorified, not only in this place tonight, but in every action and every word that we speak, Lord God, as we go through uh, whatever time you may give us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are gracious and merciful and kind. We thank you for your faithfulness and ask, Lord God, once again, be in this place tonight. Give us understanding. Help our hearts to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, man. I'm telling you, it's getting darker and darker sooner and sooner. At 2 o'clock this afternoon, I was like, I think I'm ready for bed. Like, it wasn't even nap. Like, it wasn't nap time. It was bedtime. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> Well, uh, way to call me old, Pastor. I appreciate you. Uh, no, like seriously, it's just, it's, uh, man, it's just, it's just, it's, wow, my computer's just being so good. All right, so, uh, Pastor Jeff, when he starts, he always starts with prayer. And usually one person that prays, and another person raises their hand, he calls them, and he goes, I got a praise report. All right. So we're going to try something different tonight. So I'm going to open the floor for a yay God moment. Yay God moments are praise reports. They're something small. Like, uh, you know, I woke up this morning and, and I didn't have a cough this morning. Praise God. And everybody says, praise God. Um, or if it's something big, like, uh, man, I've been battling depression uh, like you would not understand right now. And um, right now, I feel good. And everybody's going to say, yeah. Yeah. amen, and praise God. So I want to open the floor. Anybody got a praise God moment? All right, here we go, all the way in the back. I've been, I talked to my granddaughter on Sunday. She's been having a, a rough time. She's seven, so she goes to bed at night. Um, that she's still likes to bed. She's okay. Kind of Praise God. All right, somebody else with a praise God moment. I know that somebody's got one. I know somebody's got a couple. Here we go. Even though pressure keeps going up on me, it feels like stress keeps going down. Amen. Praise God. Uh, I'm going to speak this one because I know we're going to probably pray for it too. Uh, if you guys know about Richard, Richard's been going to the uh, hospital, and, and every time he goes, nobody finds any issues. Um, and that's been getting really frustrating. He's his best friend. I'm getting ticked off because I'm like, hey, that's a vet thing, man. You tell vets there's nothing going on. You don't tell guys that, you know, a civilian there's nothing. You, that, you get better health care than I do. You should be able to get notification and be told what's wrong. Well, he was able to uh, be seen, and um, we're, we're going to pray for him later. Um, but the doctor says that he's got some bulging discs, and he has to have surgery. And, and um, praise God that uh, we found out some issues. That could be triggering a lot of the other issues that are going on. So praise God on that. Um, but we will be praying for you later tonight, Richard. Um, anybody else have a praise God moment? You have to praise God or they can hear you preach today. Right, praise God on that one. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that one in a minute, Richard. <laughs> Go ahead. Praise God. I mean, uh, sorry, I'm kidding. No, but, um, so at, at conferences last week, so for school, it's like, let's take a recess. And so I drove back to the kindergarten and was, because it's this, like, there's a slew of reasons. And she started that this week, and it's just been, like, exactly what she needed. And there's, I just, like, praise the team at Southwest, because they just, like, we want the best success for her. Like, we don't want her to associate bad with school and this, and all of the team that's just surrounding her, like, fourth grade team. Dude, that's totally awesome. Um, it, it's it's so cool in our school system. We we hear so many negative things in our school system today about how society um, and the schools just they just don't get along, and how it's not about our kids anymore. 
at school. It should be about the kids, not about the image of the teachers, not about, uh, Kathy, don't hate me. It's not about the retirement and the pension for them. It's not about the pay for them. It's about the students. Yes, our teachers should be paid more. Yes, the students should be getting more uh, um, supplies in the classroom so the teachers aren't having to spend their own personal money on that. But it's so awesome when a school comes together and says, hey, we want to take this child and we want to help this child. We're going to set her up for success. And that is such a cool thing to do. So, um, so praise God on that one. So if you've ever been part of one of my sermons um, on a Wednesday, oh, did you have a praise God? Let's go with praise God. Come on, Kim, let's go. Yeah, praise God on that one. Cool way he did it too, on a pumpkin. Not on a pumpkin ride. He didn't, they weren't on a pumpkin. She won the contest of a carving. He, they handed her a pumpkin. She turned around and said, will you marry me? And Noah's on his knee and he bought her a ring. So that's a really cool thing. So, uh, so yeah, praise God on that one. So, so when we do our prayer, um, Pastor Jeff has a very good memory. And uh, so Pastor Jeff's our senior pastor. We have some new people today. Um, so uh, Pastor Jeff has a really good memory. Every single person could say their prayer request, and he'd get every single person. If he misses somebody, he'd actually catch that and say, I miss somebody. I know what they're praying for, but I can't remember who. I don't have that memory. <laughs> I don't have that luxury. We all know I don't like to talk in front of crowds. So we do something totally different. So if you guys can do me a favor, if you can stand up and come on into the circle. We're going to make a circle. You don't have to get out of your row if you don't want to. You can just turn sideways. And you're going to hold on to somebody's hand. You three have to get out of your row. Sorry. You get to come stand next to me. All right. So in today's day of age, I know holding hands is uh, not fun. Um, so I also do one, too. We used to do this with our youth group. If you put your thumb out, you can grab their thumb. If you want to hold their hand, hold their hand. I'd rather hold hands, but not everybody wants to hold my hand. Hey, Aaron, I'm going to have you do me a favor. Can you come on up here with me? We're going to slide that way. Just slide the line that way. So we can hold hands. All right, so the way this works, when we do this prayer, the way this works is uh, you're going to pray for yourself. Um, you're going to go through, and it's a quick little prayer like, hey, I've been battling with depression. Please, uh, God, take care of my depression. It's not saying it to somebody else to pray for my depression. I'm going to pray for it. Because I believe that we, as human beings, as children of Christ, should not be afraid to profess what we need prayer for to God in front of our brothers and sisters where they can pray in unison with us. Not praying for us, but they can pray in unison with us. So, Here's how it works. So, Aaron's gonna, brother Aaron's gonna start off the prayer. He's gonna do his prayer request. So I'm, I'm, I'm dragging it out right now because we have somebody still coming in. Okay. So Aaron's gonna start it, and then when he's done, you're not gonna say amen. You're just gonna squeeze the next person's hand. Okay. Now, if it comes to you and you go, I don't like praying out loud, and I don't really feel comfortable praying, and I don't want to pray. And, oh gosh, people are staring at me and I don't, nobody's going to be staring at you. They're all going to be looking at the ground because that's how we pray. But if you don't want to pray, squeeze the next person's hand. You can just skip right through. You do not have to pray. This is not mandatory. Okay? Hi, how are you? Welcome to the party. So, I'm going to actually have you switch with Aaron because Aaron's starting this and I'm finishing this. Are you okay to hold my hand? I mean, you. I can do this one if you don't hold my thumb. And she's like, <laughs> Pastor Aaron, go ahead and take, lead us in prayer, please.
Father. Uh, 2025 is going to be a wild ride for us. Father, we pray that uh, you prepare our hearts, mind, body, and spirit for whatever is about to come. In Christ's name we ask. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. Continue to do work in this ministry. I pray that there's all that will learn from me. Father God, I ask that I would still follow you.
I thank you so much, Lord. I love the fact that we get to do this. I love the fact that I have a phenomenal church family that says, hey, whatever your vision is, we're going to jump up and we're going to help you. And you're not even the senior pastor. You're not even actually a pastor of the church anymore. But I love my family. I love that, Lord. Lord, I love the fact that we get to do this. And, and the reason why I do this, Lord, is because of the fact that for youth kids, they need to understand that they can pray for each other. And they can they can profess their, their prayers to each other. And they can ask their fellow brother and sister to pray for them, Lord. And I thank you for that. But, Lord, the, your word says that... There were four friends that had a friend that was disabled. And you were in a house, and there was no room for them to get in there. And they were so dedicated that they climbed up on the roof, they opened a hole in the roof, and they lowered their friend down. And you said, because of their faith, not because of his faith, but because of their faith, to grab his mat and walk. Lord, right now, because of our faith, Lord, every single person here that prayed, Lord, every single person here that prayed, whether they prayed vocally or they prayed mentally, Lord, in their mind, Lord, you heard every single person's prayer. When one person prayed, we were all praying, Lord, and I thank you for that. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you put a healing hand on every single person here. Lord, whether it's having to walk through the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whether it's being in the lion's den with, uh, like David, or, I mean, with Daniel, or like being David and facing our Goliaths right now, Lord Jesus. No Goliath is bigger than you. No rock is stronger than a two-edged sword that you are. Your word is stronger than anything ever can do in our life. The enemy has no hold on us. There is no fear. There is no condemnation here, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for, the, for your chains being broken for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your risen son. We thank you for everything you've done, Lord. I pray, Lord, for everything that you're doing in this, in this congregation. I can't wait for the testimony Sunday. Not just one person, but that every single person is going to say, I have a testimony of what I've been praying about, and we've been seeing it, and we've been knowing about it, and everybody knows about it. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the blessing that you are in our life. We thank you that you brought a friend back to church today, Lord, who literally... Said, I have not been in church in a while, but I'm here right now. I thank you, Lord, that you literally brought her here tonight, Lord. It wasn't me. It wasn't anybody here, Lord. It was your tugging on her heart that said, go to church. And she said, your hand sent me. Just like you and I say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for that. I thank you for this awesome opportunity for every single person to be able to pray together, Lord. I thank you that I love you, Lord. Help us have a great night. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. hear my voice oh man i forgot to tell you if you struggle standing you can sit down and now that we're done i apologize that's on me um so uh wow yeah, i'm just gonna tell you right now man that was some that was some powerful praying right there i i think i think we've done it before and i usually get about 75 percent participation because a lot of people don't like to pray out loud and it was really cool i think we were at like 98 people pray 98 percent of people and that was awesome. So, uh, I mean, minus Christine, who stayed in the sound booth, which I understand. Christine, I love you. I wish you could come down and hang out with me more often because that's my sister and I love you. So here's a hug. I'm giving you a hug. I love you. Hey, let's give it up for Christine because literally every single week she's in there two days a week. Thank you, Christine. We love you. All right. So uh, as you can tell, I killed a lot of time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, if you've never heard me preach, you know, uh, or if you've heard me preach, you know, I, I'm about a 15, 20 minute person. Uh, if you've never heard me preach, <laughs> buckle up, you're in for a ride, okay? Because this is going to be fast, it's going to be fun, and uh, yeah, so I'm not Pastor Jeff. So, um, Aaron, you did something, and I literally, I said, I'm going to do that tonight. When you preached, what was it, two weeks ago? On Sunday morning, I said, I'm going to do that tonight. Aaron, you gave the, the title of your sermon. And at first when you said, I'm going to give the title of my sermon, because, and he went in his whole spiel, and I was like, why? It doesn't really, like, 
just get to your sermon. And I'm like, oh, dude, man, I, I like that. Well, I, you already, okay. All right, wait, hold on, pause real quick. Christine, what do you get from me every time I preach? You get my whole sermon. So Christine can read it before it's ever even spoken. She already knows the title, so I don't even need to tell her the title. But tonight's title is God's Call in Your Life. Are you listening? Ooh. Ooh. See, that's a smack in the head, I feel like, sometimes. Um, so tonight I'd like to talk about God's call on our life. Um, I know some of you guys are probably thinking, like, oh, he's calling us to serve in church. Yeah. Man, I, I don't want to do that. Okay, look, that's not where I'm going. Okay? However, if God puts it on your heart to serve in, like, you know, Salvation Army distribution or ringing bells or sound booth or food pantry, I can keep going. There's so many different ministries that our church has. As small as our church has, we have a huge amount of ministries and service opportunities. But that's not where I'm going tonight. Okay, so um, Pastor Jeff had talked to us, and he said, hey, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to be gone. I need some of y'all to step up and preach. So that's why you're seeing Brother Aaron preaching. Pastor Brian's been taking the, the load of it, but that's kind of his job. He has to, and I'll tell him to his face on that one. Um, but don't tell him I said that. Um, so he asked me, like, uh, hey, you want to preach on something? And I was like, well, sure. Um he gave me some advice, but yeah. So we were at Stafford Tree, and we were driving back from Stafford Tree, and I was driving, and Aaron was, you know, doing the passenger princess thing. Yes, she knows she sleeps in the car, five minutes in the car, and literally she's passed out. It's like, dude, how do you fall asleep that fast? I'm like, I stare at the ceiling forever. I'm like, so don't drive. Please don't drive, babe. So we're driving and everything. She's sleeping. And I've been praying, like, where am I going to go with this sermon? Like, I'm kind of nervous because I don't, I don't know how to come up with a sermon. And I'm not talking bad on myself. I'm not trashing myself. I just struggle. Like, some people can literally, uh, 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 Pastor Brian can read a book and he goes, ooh, that'd be a really good sermon. Here, I'll re oh, hey, look, there's a month worth of sermons out of that one paragraph. I'm like, how do you do that? Pastor Brian, well, or Pastor Jeff, well, he just opens the Bible. I mean, we got a phenomenal senior pastor who literally can open the Bible. You can literally say any chapter, verse, and word in the Bible, and he goes, oh, I can speak on that for 45 minutes. Man, some people have been doing this for 30 years. Man, my hat goes off to them, but I haven't. I'm still learning. So I'm driving and everything, and I'm praying, and I'm talking with God. I've got my worship music on, and I'm, I'm listening to... Uh, to, to just any kind of worship I can find. Not praise, but worship. And there's a difference between that. And that's a whole other sermon that Pastor uh, uh, Pastor Doug can preach on. Because he can explain that. I can too, but he's that, he's better at it. Because he talked to me about it. And I was like, I didn't realize that. But anyways. So I'm listening to worship. I'm di diving into worship. I've got tears in my eyes. And I'm like driving, driving, driving. And I, I you ever drive and you, you look out the side of your eye and you go, what, what, what was that? That was cool. And it was a sign that says, even God can use a broken crayon. Do you remember that sign? Did you see that sign when you were driving back? You were probably sleeping in the car. Probably You were probably sleeping in the car? Okay. So, so it, it, it was, it was, this really cool moment where I was driving and it said, even God can use broken crayon. And I went, wow, that's awesome. All right. How do you get the call on your life out of a broken crayon? I'm going to get there. But first, anybody ever prepare anything? Miss Kathy, you're a teacher. You're a phenomenal teacher. You ever prepare a lesson that you're just so excited for, and then five minutes before you go to class starts, you go, oh, I hope they like this. I hope it's worth it. I hope that they learn something from it. You ever had that? Yeah, all the time. Try to get you to straighten your calculator. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that, try to say that five times fast, Richard. <laughs> Jen, if you guys don't know, if you need a house bought or sold, Jen Allman, 
She is phenomenal. She, I, I, I literally loved, I, I, I introduced her to people and I sent people her way and I said, if y'all want a bulldog to fight for you, she's the one. Uh, literally, we had, we had some issues with buying, uh, what, five different houses? And every single one fell through, and then God provided this awesome one. That was so, so cool. And, and Jen was right on top of all of them. But have you ever, like, you, you get your list of what they want. They write out their list. They say, this is what I want. This is what I absolutely want, absolutely don't want, and what I'm willing to give up. And you find that house. The house house. Yeah, the, the house house. And you're like, I'm so excited. This is exactly it. And you, you, you're, as you're driving in, you're like, oh, wait, what if they don't like it? You ever had that? It's nerve-wracking, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't matter why I get them. Right? Right. They have to have a feeling that they're going to be Absolutely. And I'll be honest, I called both of the ladies out. I didn't tell them what to say. I asked them if I could call them out. But here's the reason I'm saying that. Staff retreat was two months ago, or a month ago, right? The beginning, the first weekend of October. I've been working on this sermon since the first weekend of October, and I've been excited about it. I've been diving in deep into this. And I don't dive in deep to the Word. That's my flaw. I don't dive in deep because I spiral. My rabbit trail, and I'm like, doo, doo, doo. And, and it's like I tend to mess myself up, but I've been excited. And today, my sermon was done yesterday. I took today off. So I'm not going to do anything. And then I said, I should look at my sermon. And I opened my sermon. I started going through my notes. And I said, oh, I need to add this. And I started typing more. And I started typing more. And I started typing more. And I went, oh, man, I really needed to work on my sermon some more. Man, I'm really excited. Woo, this is going to be fun. And then I got here at 4 o'clock. And I laid right there on the ground with worship music going, Oh, God, they're not going to like it. It's not going to make sense. So they're going to walk out and be like, Pastor Jeff, don't ever let him preach again because it was terrible. It was not biblically sound or anything like that. But but here we go. We're going to go with that, okay? So back to the crayon. How does the crayon relate to the call? How many times have we heard someone say or say it herself? That God can't use me because I'm broken. Or, or God can't use me if you knew my past. There's no way God loves me. If you've ever talked to somebody about Christianity or tell them that Jesus loves them, they go, yeah, right, dude. Bro, do you know what I used to do? Keyword there, used to. God took you out of that, whether you prayed to him or not. God took you out of that. God brought you out of that. He changed your heart on that. He said, I got this, whether you ask for it or not. And we're going to talk about somebody tonight who, who literally had God intervene in his life, and yet he did not ask for it. And it happened multiple times. See, when I called Pastor Jeff... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up one. So, back to a crayon. You can't use me because I'm broken. All right. Anybody have kids? Anybody have young kids that color? Hey, I'm 44 and I still color. I mean, I like to color. I'm, I, but I'm the guy that does the... <laughs> tongue out and everything like that. I don't know how to say in the lines. I drive in the lines, but I can't color in the lines. I can't cut a straight line, but I can drive a straight line. I think. Um, but I don't get sick when I drive, so I'm driving perfectly straight. So when we color, if you've ever come down to kids' church, we get kids that fight over a yellow crayon. So how do you get them to stop fighting? Pastor Rob, how do you get your kids to stop fighting? Other than, like, you know, throwing them, throwing them away or throwing them into other rooms or anything like that. Lock them in cages. That's what they do in Australia. <laughs> but here in the U.S., when a kid is fighting over a crayon, we go like this. We break it, we give it to two of them. Guess what? It may be broken, but it still is useful. It is still doing its purpose. So no matter how broken you think you are, God can still use you. So when I talked to Pastor Jeff about this, and I said, hey, 
this is where I want to go. I want to talk about Ruth. I want to talk about, uh, you know, like Abram and Sarah. Because, I mean, Sarah was broken, right? Abram was broken, right? I mean, they were old and didn't have any kids. But yet they were said they were going to be the, the parent. I mean, they, they, they're, yeah. And he said, I got a better idea. I got somewhere I want you to go. I said, all right. And he said, I want you to look at Judges. And I went, who's in Judges? Because like I said, my, my mind rabbit trails. I struggle. I struggle remembering books of the Bible. I can tell you stories of the Bible. I can tell you all these stories. Like there's three stories that I can remember when I was a child. You've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were in the... Okay? You've got Daniel and the... The only reason why I remember that is because my name is Daniel, and my dad always said, I'm going to put you in the lion's den, and I'm the lion. And I said, God will bring me out of it, hopefully. But I, <laughs> And he did. Look at me. I'm here. Um, and the third one is Samson. And as a kid, you think of Samson like... I grew up in the 80s. Samson was like Arnold Schwarzenegger, big, muscular, with a lot of long hair, Fabio. You know, he pushed down buildings and all that stuff. Samson was a superhero. But I didn't really know where to go. And Pastor Jeff and I talked about it. And then he gave me some advice. And, well, if you've ever sat down with Pastor Jeff and you ask him a question and he says, let me give you some advice. Well, you take the advice you pray about the advice, and then you do what he told you to do. Because as awesome of a pastor as he is, he's a phenomenal teacher. And he listens to what you have and where your heart is, and his advice is usually sound because he's listened to you. So I said, all right, I'll give it a try. You guys ready? Some of you guys are like, hurry up, dude. Let's get to this. So we're going to go to the Bible, and we're going to go into Judges 13. And we're going to break down a children's Bible story. And like I said, there are certain Bible stories that, when we were children, were the ones that literally stood out to us. As a child, you didn't really dive in deep to the death of Jesus. I looked at the pictures in my Bible, because I had a picture Bible. I looked at those pictures and said, wow, that looks like it hurts. But I never really understood that. But there's those stories. David and Goliath. There's an underlying meaning to it where God actually intervened in those and did something that's an underlying message. Correct? Mm -hmm. So, the Israelites. Man... Those people don't know how to do anything right. They were so bad, not living God's way, God basically delivered them to the Philistines. And said, y'all got to, they're going to take care of you now. I, I, they're going to take care of you. For 40 years. <coughs> Excuse me. For 40 years, they, had to take, they were taking care of, the, uh, the Philistines were taking care of the Israelites. And then, in uh, Judges 13, 2-5, in the NIV, it says, A certain man of Zorah named uh, Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become a pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you do not drink wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched with by a razor, because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Dedicated to God from the womb, he will take the, leading in the, uh, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So, if you don't know what a Nazarite is... Now, understand, I know a lot of you guys. I know your heart. I know a lot of you guys have been Christians longer than me. You're smarter than me. You're better people than me. I understand that. But I did not know what a Nazarite was. Like I had heard the name, but I didn't know it. A Nazarite is a man or woman who takes a vow to consecrate themselves to God. They do this on their own and make a vow that they won't drink wine, 
They won't eat grape. They won't even eat grapes because that's where wine comes from. They won't cut their hair and they won't defile themselves by touching carcasses. See, before Samson was even born, God had a call on his life. Do you know that Samson was one of three men who were voluntold to be a Nazarite? You've got Samuel. He was voluntold. John the Baptist. And then Samson. So i got a quote for you. If you're taking notes, here you go. God uses ordinary people to accomplish his purpose. Think about it. Samson's parents were ordinary people. There was nothing extraordinary about them. Is that like another set of parents that we know in the Bible? Who were ordinary people? Who created life that became an extraordinary human being? There we go. I heard somebody say it. <laughs> God uses them and brings us Samson. So... Tell me God doesn't have a plan for your life. So we're going to fast forward to Judges 14, 1 to 2. There, I know, I, I know we're jumping ahead, and I promise this will all make sense, I hope. This is where I'm starting to get in my mind, Kathy, where, you know, hey, what if it's not making sense? What if it did it earlier when I was drinking Mountain Dew? Um, so back to Judges 14, 1 to 2. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. All right. A couple years ago, I did a sermon on uh, Joseph. What age are usually the men when they're starting to get married? Do you guys remember? Nope. They're going to be right around 15, 18 years old is when they start looking. 18 to 21, 22 is when the parents are like, hey, we want to... You're doing well for yourself. At 18 years old, he's probably not super mature. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that part again. I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Kim, if your son said something like that to you, I have seen the box of Cheerios that I want. Get that for me as my cereal. What would you tell him? <laughs> yeah, don't, okay, we'll leave it at that one. We'll leave it at that one because uh, I saw her eyes. I No, 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 no. Uh, I don't want to. I, you cannot say that in church. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like he's a brat. I feel like he's a spoiled brat. I feel like he's never heard the word no. He gets what he wants. I'm going to show you why I think this. Jump ahead to Judges 14, 5 to 7. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked to the woman, and he liked her. Did you guys catch that? All right, some of you guys, like I told you, some of you guys are smarter than I am. See, I did it at first. So I called Pastor Jeff. He didn't answer. Uh, I'm grateful he didn't answer. I didn't really want to bother him, but it's the first thing I do. You call your senior pastor, I got a question, I need your help, you're smarter than me. And then I went, ooh, I'll call Pastor Brian. And I called Pastor Brian and I said, hey, he answered the phone and he goes, what's up? And I said, hey, I'm working on my sermon and, and, and I got a question for you. It's not an apologetics question. It's a hermeneutical question. He goes, oh boy. <laughs> I'm game for it. I'm trying. And I said, all right, I'm in Judges. He said, all right, let me get my Bible. So he gets his Bible. He opens his Bible. And I read this verse to him. And I read all of it to him. And he goes, okay, what's your question? And I said, all right, let me back up. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. We tracking that? Yes? North, south? Cool. He killed the lion with his bare hands. And then it says, But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. How can you be traveling with your parents? Okay, I'm not a parent, so y'all gonna have to like, you know, explain some 
future stuff that I have to look out for. But how come you traveling with your parents kill a lion and your parents don't notice? What? With your bare hands. How do you get blood all over you? I mean, it's not like he had a, like, it's not like he was Dexter. If you know who Dexter is, some of you guys don't want to admit you know who Dexter is. It's not like he has a uh, plastic suit on him that he's like, ooh, I'm going to kill a lion. Do, 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 do. Rip. Now, let me take my clothes off that are covered in blood, and I'm going to walk back up to my parents like, yo, what's up? Yes, Christine. Cool. It does. you It could be that it does not say when the lion came in. I think it does say though, as they approached. Can't be uh, while they were sleeping. It says as they approached the vineyard, a young lion came at them. All right. So here's where my mind went, because Pastor Brian said I'll do some research, and he sent me some links today. Mind you, when did I finish my sermon? Yesterday. Yesterday. I worked on it a little bit today, but it was done yesterday. Then he sends me a sermon. What time did I get here today? Four, Four o'clock. He sends me a sermon at 5.30. Some notes. And then I open it up. I'm like, yes, I'm really excited to read this. And it says, access denied. You need permissions. <laughs> so he come walking in, and I was talking with Jen, and he uh, come walking in, and he looks at me, and he goes, what would you think? I was like, bro, I needed, I needed permissions. I sent you a request, and you did not respond to me. And he goes, I didn't know I needed to. <laughs> so as I walk out, I said, you're ruining my sermon, Pastor Brian. He didn't really ruin it because I didn't really read it. I'm grateful for it, and I'm going to go back to reading it because I want to, because I want to understand this. He sent me three uh, commentaries on where, and I guess people have actually caught on to that. How can he kill a lion when he's with his parents. So here's what I think. Anybody ever take their kid to the mall? Oh, actually, let's go, let's go back because malls aren't cool anymore. How many of us used to go to the mall when we were younger, right? Okay. Our parents used to take us. And you, had, you were either one or two, two kids. Uh, hey, Aaron, can I bother you real quick? Come on up. <laughs> he does not know I'm doing this. So you're either one of two kids. You are going to be my dad. Okay? And we're going to walk in the mall. So let's go for a walk. Hey, Dad, can I go in that store? No. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. Aaron, go back and sit down, please. Thank you. Let's give it up for Aaron. He did exactly what I wanted to do. That is one of the children. The other child is, as the car is pulling up to a parking spot, that kid has unlocked the door, jumped out, did an airborne roll, yelled something at his parents, ran into the, into the mall, and you don't see him for the next four hours. You're literally spending your time, instead of going shopping, you're spending your time, where is that little brat? I'm going to find him, I'm going to find him. Right? We would never do any of that. Like, oh, I never did anything like that. I'm so old, I used to call my parents collect and, and instead of when it, the operator. And it would say, you have a collect call from? It would say, instead of my name, it would say, I'm ready to be picked up. See you at Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, you have done that too. It was the best way to save mom 35 cents, okay? These kids these days, you ask them what a pay phone is, and they go, what? The way you pay on your phone on minutes? I'm like, no. Oh, gosh, no. All right. <laughs> Richard, I'm so glad you know me. So I think he ran off. I think the caravan's going this way, and he was out this way on the other side of the vineyard doing whatever he wanted to do. I talked to another pastor friend of mine, and he says, I think it's bad leadership on the parents. I think it shows something to the parents that they don't know how to say no, and they don't know how to control them. I said, but why? And he goes, they're afraid of him. Because they knew his call in his life before he was even born. They knew he was going to be a holy man, so they had to treat him like that. So you let him get away with whatever he wants? All right, cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. That's, that's going to be fun. I feel, now, mind you, this is my own interpretation. This is not a biblical statement. There's no biblical background that I can actually go back on. But I feel like Samson is Veruca Salt. Oh, come on, people. Some people have seen Willy Wonka. Veruca Salt. 
I want this, I want this, I want this, I want the golden egg, and I want it to lay a dozen eggs every single morning, and I want it to be filled with... That was Samson. I want this, you're going to give it to me, this is what I'm going to have. And it started at a young age. He didn't ask his parents to go, because back in the day, that's, you didn't date. You literally, your parents would connect you with somebody. It wasn't even his own people. And he said, I don't care, I want her. Get her for me. So I think he's very immature. I think he's a spoiled little brat. Yes, I said that, and when I get to heaven, him and I will have a conversation, and I'll shave his head, and I'll know that I'll win. Cool. If you don't know, that's how Samson loses his power. Okay, we'll get there. All right. But the coolest part about that, uh, that, that whole verse that I just read was that it says that the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He didn't say, God, give me the power to defeat this lion. He said, I I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go do it. And the Spirit of the Lord said, I got you. I'm going to give you the power to do this. He didn't call on the power of God. But yet, God gave it to him. He didn't live a life for God. But yet, God still gave it to him. So I'm going to ask you another question. Tell me God can't use you for his good. All right. If we look through Judges, we see that uh, Samson doesn't really live a life that was prophesied over him. He doesn't live like a holy man. He doesn't do anything like a holy man. Samson kind of has a temper. Right? Anybody here have a temper? No, no I do. I have a temper. I don't mind. I, I, I can say I have a temper. And I still question my call. Because if I have a temper, what if I become a senior pastor and that one person approaches me and I just flip tables on them and I just... Grrr! What if I'm a youth pastor or a kids pastor and that kid just comes up to me and just... I know he's a terrible little Jay Lee and I can't beat him. I'm just kidding. Jay Lee, I love you, Jay Lee. I've known Jay Lee a long time. Oh, sweet. Sweet Roy. Sweet Jay Lee. Sweet Jaylee, uh huh. You know who her aunt is, right? I mean, uh, anyways, so, uh, just kidding, I love you. I love you. I'm gonna get in trouble. So he didn't live a life that was prophesied over him. In Judges 14, 8, 9, it says that he saw a lion, the lion carcass that he had killed with his bare hands. Mind you, when he killed it, he was already doing something wrong. It was unclean. It was a carcass, and he was touching it. He's not supposed to. Then he goes back, sees it again, and when he sees it, he says, Oh, hey, look, there's honey growing in the carcass. Ooh. That's some fermented meat. And then bees are creating honey. And he goes and starts eating the honey. That right there is against the laws of the Nazarite. And yet God still gives him the power to do the things he needs to do. And then he goes like this. He takes another bot pile and he goes to his parents and he gives it to his parents. If your son, <laughs> let's, let's go with Zachary. If Zachary walked up to you and said, and he's literally, ooh, they didn't have jars. They didn't have plastic tubes to put it in. So it's in his hands. And he goes, here you go, mom. I brought this home for you. Here you go, dad. Would you eat it? It's oozing over his hands. Hey, I would know it was from a carcass, yeah. You're right. It doesn't. It said that he did not tell them where he got it. I, I'm sorry. Some of your kids have brought me stuff and go, Pastor Danny, and I go, No, 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 no. I, you just came from the bathroom. Nope, not having that. <laughs> so, so there's that. Now let's jump ahead to Samson's wedding. Samson's hanging out with all of his uh, thirty uh, companions. And they say, hey, they try to trick him and everything. And then he goes, let me give you a poem. And he writes a poem for them. And he said, if you can figure it out in seven days, I'll give you third, I'll give you a new outfit for each one of you. But if you can't, you have to give me 30 outfits. So they trick his wife. And they trick his wife so bad that he tells her 
Now, mind you, there, that, we're already painting a picture right here. He tells his wife the answer to the riddle. She runs off, tells the 30 companions. On the night of the, uh, the seventh night, they tell him the answer to the riddle. So he gets mad because he says, the only way you would have known that was because you were with my wife. And you tricked my wife into doing that. So, And he called her a heifer. He, he literally did. He called her a heifer. And so then he goes out and he killed 30 people in a different village, tore, stripped them of their clothes, went back in and gave the clothes to the uh, companions. When the Philistines heard about this, they went after uh, them. They attacked Samson. Samson killed more people. And then they, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, they jumped ahead. Samson's wife was given to uh, one of his companions. Samson goes back to see his, uh, brings a goat to go see his wife. And his, uh, his father-in-law says, oh, uh, she's with one of your companions. Wouldn't you want my daughter? She's much prettier. Now Samson's even more mad. So then he literally takes 300 foxes, ties up their tails, attaches the torch to them, lights the torch, sends them off into the fields, burns all the corn, all the wheat, all the vineyards, burns everything. And the Philistines get mad. And they go to the bride and the father and say, "Why? who did this? They said, Samson, why? And they explain. So they burn Samson's wife and his, uh, her father. So now Samson's even more mad. So then he goes off and he kills people. So he's got more anger issues. He's I can get revenge now. He was actually, he actually said, I can get payback for this. I don't see, a, I don't see any anger issues in this man's life. He's perfectly normal. To a point where they sent a thousand men to kill him. And it says that he picked up a fresh donkey jawbone. And killed every single one of them. So he's killing them with an unclean jawbone of a donkey. And he kills everybody. And it says the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him as he was doing that. So every single time that he's doing anything, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, but yet he's still living unclean. It's amazing that Samson lived a life for himself, but yet was still blessed by God. It's not part of this message, but jump all the way forward until he meets Delilah. He's with Delilah. And she keeps asking him night after night, how, do, how can you be a regular man? What gives you the power? And he tells her a lie every single time. Remember, how, what did he do to his wife? Told her the name of the riddle. And she told everybody? Do you think after the first time you told somebody uh, the answer to something, you probably would protect your uh, secrets? He tells her the secret. Every single time he tells her the secret, it happens to him. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Every time he says anything, every time he does anything, tells her it happens to him. And yet he comes out clean. She shaved his head, doesn't come out clean. He ends up killing everybody with him. Fast forwarding. And yes, even then too, without the power of his hair, he literally still had the power of the Holy Spirit come upon him when he pushed down the pillars. And the reason why I didn't dive into the end of the story, but I focused on the beginning of the story was, we're all still young. Okay? We all still got life in us. Are you still doing the call that God called in your life? And I'm not asking you as in like the job you have, Aaron. Is it the exact job that God puts you into? I can't answer that. But what if God is still using you? I, I, I heard a pastor talk about these kids' stories. He said one of the coolest things that you need to understand is God, when they prayed, did not stop it. He brought them through it. They had to go through it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go through the fire. God didn't intervene before the fire. He intervened in the fire. Daniel, in the lion's den, intervened in the lion's den. David and Goliath, when he was in front of of Goliath. Samson had to walk his walk. He had to go through everything he was going through. Even though he did not do it in the right way, God still lived his life. 
Christine, you want to mute my music? Please. Samson was driven by emotion. So let me ask you a question. What drives you? So I want you to close your eyes. I told you we'll be done early. Even after that long prayer, we'll still be done early. Because I like to be done early. But I want you just to think about the questions I'm going to ask you. What drives you? Are you driven like Samson to do things for the glory for yourself? And I'm not saying that in a selfish way. That's not what I'm trying to say. Do you do what you do because it draws attention to you and it makes you feel good? Or are you driven or is your satisfaction driven because it's drawn the attention I said it earlier, I know everyone here. I know your hearts. I know you guys. I know I'm talking to amazing people. I'm not doubting anybody's resolve here. I'm not doubting anybody's faith. I'm not doubting anybody's heart. But it is so easy for us to get trapped in ourselves. The best advice I got when I became a pastor, was stay humble. Brother Aaron, when you become a pastor, I'm going to tell you the same thing. Stay humble. You're a phenomenal preacher. People are going to give you all kinds of compliments. People are going to tear you down. Stay humble. And you're talking about your call and, and why you're going to ministry. Stay humble because God's going to use you. Miss Jaylee, you are going to do amazing things in that center that you are going to in New Hampshire. You're going to want to praise yourself and say, man, I was so awesome. I saved this person's life because if you've never saved someone's life, it will mean the world to you. And the moment you do that, stay humble. Miss Kathy, you are going to raise some amazing students in that school. Some of those students are going to reach out to you and say, Miss Kathy, my life changed that day because you did this. Pastor Rob, I know it. I know it right here in my heart, brother. Within the next two or three years, you're going to have multi-million dollars on your reins. You're going to bring that in, bro. Somebody's going to come in and they're going to bless you. So full, you're going to have so many volunteers, you're going to be turning people away. I know it. Because people are going to know who you are. But in that moment, your Salvation Army commanders are going to you be like, you guys are doing an amazing job. Stay humble. How many of us can say that we know our call right now and are doing exactly, exactly what God has called us to do? How many of us said that we are not worthy of God's love? ever felt that you were not worthy of God's love, I want you to raise your hand real quick. Can I tell you right there, thank you for your willingness to raise your hand, but can I tell you that's the enemy lying to you? Your Father in Heaven died on the cross. He went to hell, and in three days He rose again. He broke the chains of society. He broke the chains of sin. He broke the fear died for all that for you. If you can tell me your kids are worth your love, how can you respond with saying that you were not worth his love? God created every hair on your head, every freckle on your face. God loves you. Stay home. What is your call? says we got eight minutes. The clock back there says we got five minutes. I'm going to go up the clock back there because it's faster. So 
what I would like to do. But I'm going to ask Christine just to keep the music playing. I'm going to open the altar. You don't have to come up to the altar. You don't have to come up. God knows your heart, whether where you're sitting. You can be sitting in your car driving home tonight. If you got to get on the road to drive home because of the darkness, I am totally okay with it. I am sitting right there in the passenger seat with you because I don't like driving in the dark. I'm going to beg my wife to leave a car here tonight so I can ride home with her. <laughs> I'll make that sacrifice to drive back tomorrow to get my car. So if you got to go, I understand. If you want to stay in your seat, I'm all for it. If you want to meet, hang out with somebody you want to talk, I'm all for it. Just try to keep it a little quiet. Just be aware of the people that are praying. But I'm going to open the altar. God, I just thank you so much. I thank you. I thank you for my nerves. I thank you for the nerves that I was having going through this sermon today. The excitement for the sermon, but also the nerves of the sermon. But Lord, I thank you that your words come through. Lord, I glorify you. I give you all the glory in the world. I don't want the glory. And it's so easy to say it, Lord. But Lord, I'm asking you to show us how to do that. Whatever we're going through right now, Lord, you just, I ask that you be with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everybody that's here. I pray blessing over every single person.